Can I get your attention, please? Woo! Yo, yo. You ready for this? Coming at you from Wicked Big Studios in Peabody, Massachusetts. Ladies and gentlemen, sit back, buckle up, because you're in the happy hour with your boy. What's up, everybody? Happy to be back. It seems like it's been a while since we spoke. It's only been a week, but it's still great to be back. I got Big D in studio here. Actually, he's not on the microphone because he's too busy packing up all these orders, trying to get them out for our Friday uh, morning mail out. Guys, I can't thank you enough for everything you're doing with all, you know, supporting the show, buying all the, buying all the Happy Hour swag and everything else. The Happy Hour Social Club on Facebook is going awesome. I, I can't thank you guys enough. One way I could think of, though, to thank you guys was I got a gift for you tonight. What I have on, uh, for you guys is uh, the number one ranked welterweight in the world fighting under the Bellator banner for, and the former uh, World Series of Fighting Champion is here with us, John Fitch, uh, Happy Hour Social Club VIP member and uh, just an all-around great guy. John, welcome to the Happy Hour. So good to have you, bud. Awesome, man. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, you know, John. John's down there in uh, a little bit of a different uh, time uh, time difference. He's down in San uh, San Jose, California. Uh, you know, we get some great people out in San Jose, which I love to come out and visit. We appreciate you with the time difference. Still getting with us all here in the happy hour. Thank you so much, pal. I appreciate that. How's uh, San Jose treating you, big man? Man, it is cold today. I tell you, there's there's actually frost in the window this morning. Wow, it's funny. I talked to uh, I talked to my brother Anthony, who lives down there. Anthony Decato's down in uh, San Jose with you. Uh, lives actually fairly close, I imagine, to uh, the SAP Center. And uh, he's uh, I was telling him, you know, that I was uh, going to be chatting with you. He's like, "Yeah, man, it's cold down here, and we, you know, we normally feel bad. I, you know, oh man, I feel terrible. Sixteen degrees up here, John. So if you want to feel cold, yeah. <laughs> that's going to be. Uh, well, I tell you, though, like I'm, I'm from uh, I'm from the Midwest. I'm from Indiana. Yep. And it it gets it gets cold air. We we get the wind chill factor. So it gets it get awfully awfully icy. But um something about West Coast. It's like they, they cut costs on building construction and they didn't insulate anything. Yeah. And so it's, it's like <laughs> it, so when you go to like cold weather climates, like it's cold outside but you got big jackets, whatever on and you go inside and it's like insulated and nice and warm. Yeah. Well, like, it's just cold everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Here. And, and being, you know, and uh, being in San Jose, I'm sure that, you know, you expect, when you go out there, you expect it to be warm, and then the cold feels even worse. I, yeah. I, I always tell a joke that uh, Baywatch lied to me. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I grew up watching that. I thought it was beaches and, and blondes and bikinis and, and uh, sunny, hot weather all the time. I get up here and it's people, you know, wearing baggy pants and sweatshirts to the beach. Yeah, and, the, uh, cold cold weather in the winter time. Traded the bikini and the uh, board shorts in for some winter hats and some, uh, some winter coats. Forget some, about it. Some blue, yeah, you what, some blue hair. <laughs> I actually, you know, what's funny is you're totally off subject of fighting everything else. One thing that I did want to ask you, something that you know, I warm up with myself. I know that you're a man who enjoys his whiskey. I mean, is that correct? I love me some good uh, Habiki Harmony. Have, that's. I was going to ask you because yeah. it's a new brand, and I, I actually tried it myself. And I, I mean, they're not a sponsor of the show or anything. But have you ever tried uh, any Screwball whiskey yet? I have not tried Screwball. I don't believe it's a it's a new one that come out. And you know, I wasn't really a big whiskey guy, and uh, actually. Uh, Big D brought it to me here at the show, and I was actually on that. I'm like, oh, I ain't drinking whiskey during the show. I'll tell you what, this it's a it's a peanut butter whiskey. It's supposed to be for the black sheep and this and that, the, the screwballs, and it's a peanut butter peanut whiskey. Peanut butter whiskey, it, interesting. It tastes like you're drinking peanut butter, which I mean, any I mean, I'm a I'm a huge peanut butter fan. That, that's a weakness of mine. I love <laughs> it. I, yeah, all my proteins and things like that, I always got, you know, the peanut butter flavor there for like a reward. But I'll tell you what, this peanut butter whiskey, it's dangerous. 
Man, I bet that sounds kind of good. Yeah, I've, honestly, one of these times when you're doing it, you gotta uh, you gotta give it a try. If not, if not, when uh, next time I'm back down there on Santana Row, I'll uh, we'll have to get you get you one of them. You try that out. Yeah, it's you unbelievable. Tell, yeah, next time you're out here, yeah, we'll hit up Santana Row for sure. Yeah, I, I actually one of the spots down there is uh, Sino. I believe it's called. I don't know if I'm saying Sino, it right. Yeah, uh, I enjoyed that place a lot when I, I was don't. There. I don't. I yeah. I I, uh, I go there sometimes, not all the time. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it was well, good. Uh, the number of times that I've been there compared to the years I've lived here is, is, is not that many, but uh, I usually have a good time when I go. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Is the uh, how's the new place going? I know that you got the new place. You're building the uh, studio in 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 home and everything. Everything's going good. It's yeah, great. man. I uh, I got a new uh, townhouse uh, this last summer, and I was I was actually staying uh, stayed for a year downtown. Uh, uh, you know, a few blocks away from from uh, SAP, so it's probably near your, uh, your buddy. Yep, yep. Um, but, uh, yeah, like, uh, moved, to, moved in here, and then I, I, I basically turned the garage, like, I can't, I, my, I gotta drive a big truck. My truck doesn't fit in the garage anyways. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, I turned the garage into a workspace, so I have, half of it is a, a 10 by 20 section that's matted off with a two and a half inch the grappling mats and the walls are matted <clears throat> and then i have uh, a little 10 by 10 space for my weights and my my, my weight rack uh, my squat rack yep and then i have a little 10 by 10 space for my uh podcasting area and i just i just updated the backdrop recently i was instructed that the uh the background i had was, was a little too busy so we, we simplified it made it a little bit more classier and then uh, we might make a couple changes here and there to it, maybe some lighting stuff. But yeah. you know, I figure if I'm gonna if I'm gonna do the podcasting thing, do it right, I'm gonna go all in and, and uh, make it a sweet little spot. Absolutely, guys. What he speaks of is actually he has a uh, podcast as well called John Fitch Knows Nothing. Mm -hmm. He's uh, always in. He actually, he's brave. He goes live. He has the video podcast going. Uh, it's it's a great follow. You guys gotta follow him on uh, number one. You gotta go to JohnFitch.net. Second. Follow him on Instagram, John uh, John Fitch on Instagram. He's a, a great follow. You'll actually see this whole thing taking place. As I've actually, I actually feel like I've been there helping out with the construction. Obviously, you could use the hands. <laughs> I feel bad saying that, but I've seen it. You know, I've seen you going through it. The gym looks great. A lot of good uh, workout tips on that, as well as like I said, watching the uh, progress of the house. It looks awesome. Yeah, man, it's, it's been a lot of fun. Um, you know, just trying to trying to find a way to. Uh, to uh, make my living and, and do some cool stuff that I enjoy doing without, you know, beating people up in the cage. Yep. So John Fitch Smash on Instagram is uh, what it is. And the, the, Fitch, the Fitch Smash uh, system actually is something that's in the works. Is this correct? <clears throat> well, I mean, the Fitch Smash system is, is my, uh, it's basically my martial art. Just like Bruce Lee took all the best things he could find and created a Jeet Kune Do. I took all the best techniques that I, I could find and uh, put them into a very basic, simple system that anybody could follow. And it's my SMASH system. The SMASH stands for Simple Measures Against Serious Hostile. Mm -hmm. That um, means uh, it, it's a it, self-defense system, correct? Well, it's, it's a, just a combat system. Yep. You can adjust it for police military use. You can adjust it for self-defense. Or you can adjust it to fit uh, your, your MMA approach. Absolutely. Um, it's just it's just like a basic uh a basic framework for fighting yep all right so it's like uh if you took a, a you know one of those import racing cars right it's like you, you buy a you honda acura at the lot that's that's the fit smash you can you can put mass in it you can put different tires a tail fin ground effects whatever that's that's up to you to put on that extra but i wanted one concise uh, system that people could learn, and and I feel that my system will take you from from zero to fight ready uh, faster than, than any system out there. Absolutely. For those who don't know, John is, in my eyes, uh, pretty much an innovator of violence. I mean, <laughs> as 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 uh, soft spoken as he is, this man was uh, the team uh, wrestling team captain yeah, at nice. Purdue, and then I mean <clears throat> to be to put that to I go ahead. To start, uh, I'm gonna have to start signing my emails with that innovator of violence. <laughs> He's uh, 
I mean, uh, here, put it on my business card, maybe. That's good. That's really good. I'm gonna steal it. See, see, that's a good one, <laughs> right? I mean, you, uh, I mean, you went from you started wrestling is the in Purdue, moved on, you know. I mean, all the way to AKA now, where I mean, you're a, I mean, been a mainstay for a long time, and I, I, it's now you're actually running your own self defense courses out of there as well. I mean, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm uh, I'm doing uh, I'm gonna start doing a series of seminars, and I've been doing seminars for a long time. But you know, I wanted to be able to bring martial arts and basically self you know self defense people having the confidence to know how to like defend themselves uh, to, to everybody, so that I'm not just limited to people who are doing MMA or studying MMA or you know jujitsu practitioners. I want to be able to take somebody who has zero experience, has zero gym memberships and uh, still wants to have some basic level of knowledge on how to stay alive. <laughs> um, yep. I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, there's a lot of young men out there too, who don't, uh, who don't really understand that you need to, there's a lot of mastery that goes along with, with growing up to be a, a, a full fledged man, you know, like yep. you need to master your finances. You need to master your relationships. You need to master your health and fitness, and you need to master violence. Uh, you need you need to be the warrior in a garden rather than a gardener in a war. So, regardless of how peaceful things may seem, anything can happen at any moment. You need some base level of knowledge of survival. So, you you need you need those levels of mastery in your life if you ever really want to be a completed, fulfilled man. Absolutely, and you need to you need to have some of these tools in your tool belt uh, that you wear every day. It can't be just something you know in a pinch. You you know can think back. You, these these need to you need to be well oiled machine. I couldn't agree more. Also, one yeah, thing too and, is and uh, honestly like, like just just little basic knowledge goes a long way. Your average person, honestly, your average person has no idea how to fight. I mean, just just spend an afternoon googling or uh, looking around on YouTube. At street fights, <laughs> and it's just it's, people have really no idea. Everybody, everybody thinks they know how to fight, but nobody really knows how to fight. Exactly, and when you end up, when you end up in a you, uh, somebody who's one hundred and seventy pounds, one hundred and sixty pounds could end up in a fight with somebody who has no clue what they're doing, who's two twenty, two thirty, and just really yeah. embarrass them, and you know, get themselves, yeah. uh, you know, get themselves out of a sticky situation quick and out the door. Yeah. You know, it's, you know, you can put and somebody to sleep. It's not, and even, uh, it's not even a, a comment on fitness level. You you have, you know, Jack the gym dude who's never had any lick of self-defense in his life, and he'll get beat up by a fat guy who's had some boxing as a, as a teenager. Absolutely. And, I mean, forget about when you add in some other, you know, like kickboxing, things like that, when you get, you know, Muay Thai or Krav Maga, something along mm -hmm. those lines. I mean... That's basically all this stuff is mixed into the Fitch system from, you know, everything mm -hmm. I've seen, plus uh, everybody, he's his yeah, pa your Patreon I've, and everything like that. I've spent a lot of time, uh, you know, training, training different things. I, I got certified uh, level four instructor in uh, Modern Army Combatives Program, the MACT program. Um, I, I, I've uh, done some lessons and work with some guys who've done some, some, some of the spear stuff. Uh, you know, I've, I've talked with guys and, and done some stuff with, uh, I don't do any weapons stuff because I don't have enough knowledge, but I have done some, some weapons training, uh, and some, even some tactical driving, which is insane. So I've, I've had a lot of experience with different, different survival type things. Yep, I mean, in everybody, like I said, if somebody, if they do visit johnfitch.net, they can see all the stuff. I mean, you have a, a bunch of really fantastic uh, blogs on there, mm -hmm. it, it links to your videos, and as well as, you know, you, you do actually show a lot of good stuff on uh, YouTube. He's a great follow on YouTube, guys. Anybody who mm -hmm. doesn't follow him should, because things from, you know, basic, you know, nutrition, fitness, you know, and then, of course, John Fitch knows nothing, which... Starting in 2020 is going to be the new hit, right? I mean, that takes over for the uh, old school shake break, correct? Yeah, you know, I was doing the daily uh, live streams and kind of just kind of getting a feel for things, getting better at being in front of the camera and, and talking to people and coming up with ideas. And then now with 2020, I've decided to kind of do more interview style um, podcast with it. So it won't be daily, but I'm, I'm probably I'm going to try to still post a video every day. So I'm either going to do an interview with somebody for for the podcast, 
or I'll be posting uh, some video blog stuff up on YouTube. So I've, I've been doing that this week. Uh, um, today I posted a, a video with uh, talking about, you know, Stephen King made some comments about um, quality of art and he got attacked. And then I, uh, I posted a video the other day about Conor McGregor's comments about how much money he was making. And, nope. and uh, Bloody Elbow wrote an article pretty much calling him out as a liar <laughs> because through, through the, through the um, class action lawsuit that's going on with UFC, uh, we've seen the financial records up to 2000, 2017, and the claims he made just don't match up. The money's not there in their own accounts of money being paid out to fighters. I do wonder with some of these, if there are some, you know, hidden bonuses, things like that with, you know, people that come in that they there, try to... No, there are uh, there are definitely hidden bonuses from UFC to people with indiscretionary uh, bonuses. But that's all reported through the lawsuit. Right? Really? Like all the finances are seen, yeah. For the, for, uh, there are some so people... If, if you look... Uh, John Nash, bloody elbow. You can you can look up the uh, the, the commentator money comments, but they wrote a really really good article uh, about it, and uh, John Nash goes into detail. John Nash is a journalist, one of the very few. There's only like four guys that are covering it, but he's one of the few guys who have gone really into detail about going through the public records that the the court has made available to everybody, um, and he can see through what's been outed in the lawsuit that that his numbers and what he's saying just doesn't add up. At least none of the money is coming from the UFC. He may, if he's making this money, it's through sponsorships or through his, his uh, whiskey company. Yeah. It's not coming from, uh, it's not being written from, uh, you know, the old school Zufer or C, uh, mm-hmm. CMI. Uh, sorry. I forget the name of the new company now. But well, it's w, WME. WME, yes, yes. The uh, yeah. local Patriots owner here actually has a has a portion of that. I've I've been told. Mm-hmm. Uh, one other thing, uh, you, you, people that don't know, there is a large lawsuit uh, against the UFC that um, you actually mm-hmm. have a lot to do with. Also, um, I do notice. I a question for you, John. Do you notice that not many media outlets are you know covering this whatsoever? I mean, this isn't readily oh, available. one hundred percent. They know, because there are no, it is not media. There is no media in mixed martial arts. It's it's public relations. It's all PR. Yeah. It's... If you step outside the line of public relations, you lose access. You will no longer be allowed to come to the events. And there's a quite a large possibility that they will tell their fighters not to talk to you ever again. Yeah, so... um, I talked to um, somebody who works with Bloody Elbow, um, and Bloody Elbow does uh, pieces that, that are not PR. They will actually be journalistic pieces that challenge what the UFC is doing or saying. And uh, there are managers who I'm sure get word from the UFC, but there are managers who tell their guys and won't let their guys talk to Bloody Elbow. Wow. I'll tell you, there was one, uh, one, of, uh, one of our past guests I had on, actually. She's, um, uh, Trish Morrison was on the show, the wife of uh, Tommy the Duke Morrison. And I had her on here. We spoke about the, uh, her pending lawsuit against the uh, Nevada State Athletic Commission and uh, Quest Diagnostics that actually, after they tested Tommy for HIV, and he gave, you know, he had to retire from boxing and gave up his $88 million contract, now states that his HIV finding was a harmless error and unfortunate. So they, this is in court right now. And they said this man had HIV. Then six years later, they gave him back his boxing license. It was like, oh, sorry, we never even tested you for it. Now he's fighting. He tried to fight to get his money back. He's since passed. His wife is trying to, you know, clear his name. But nobody will cover it. I actually got some some crazy uh, messages about, you know, for going over and saying, oh, what are you doing? You know, that's, you know, you basically I was like, wow, why people are really haters. It's. It's unbelievable that when you, if you cover something that well, people don't want to talk about, they go all over you. Well, people people get um, heavily invested into their ego. Mm-hmm. Right? They have ego investments about their belief systems, and if you challenge their belief systems, they will they will destroy you because they don't want the world, the reality that they've created around them, to be challenged. <laughs> Absolutely, you're right. I'm nail you're hitting the nail on the head right there. I um. Mm-hmm. It's it's but so, I, so anybody listening yep. should should uh, remember that 
And like anytime you might you might get a feeling like that, if somebody's challenging your belief system, instead of attacking them and getting angry and wanting to do something to them or shut them down, like really reflect back into what it is you believe in and why. Are you, is your belief system correct? Maybe you're missing something. Like maybe just maybe you're wrong. Yeah, and people hate to admit they're wrong. You know, some people. I'll tell you what. Nobody I, I, wants to admit they're wrong. Oh, I know. Uh, I ninety uh, percent of the people I know are like that. I, I'll tell you what. I've been known. I've been well, known to eat I, crow, I say, though. I say that um, everything falls into to uh, two two things with with biological creatures, right? Uh, there's there's two main rules, basis of existence for us is that. It's, you know, survival and, and uh, reproduction. Everything we do is based around those two things. Uh, so I think somebody not uh, wanting to admit they're wrong has a lot to do with uh, the survival instinct, right? Because if you're wrong, that's death. So it, like you in your head, you have to be correct, or yeah. your life might end. Yeah, you you did questioning your manhood if you if you uh, you know one bit off on any conversation. It's it's you know people have their ideas, like you say, and it's it's just the I don't know I don't think if it's a testosterone thing or because it's it's with women as well. You know, you can't be wrong. Well, no, no, that's that's what I'm saying. It's a yeah. survival, it's a survival instinct. Like your 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 ideas and your belief system is your path to living and surviving. So if somebody questions you and say, "Yeah, I know you're doing it wrong," they're basically saying, "You know, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're not going to survive. What you're doing is the wrong thing." And I think people fight hard against that because they really want to believe that what they're doing is going to aid in their survival. That's like a lizard brain thing. You're not even thinking about consciously. Absolutely, these are. Uh... <laughs> We we couldn't agree more on most of this stuff, and hearing you say it, it's just like it's like you just put that in great words, and I mean you got it right out there. That's I, it was almost like you took the thought right out of my head. That's fantastic. I uh, another thing actually I wanted to touch on with you was um, speaking of uh, deep thoughts and everything. We have uh, in front of me. I have uh, fallen up with death by ego, which is uh, a book here that um, you wrote actually authored by yourself. Mm -hmm. And in here, it basically goes back, and this is basically a journal from back in the day yeah. as it takes you up. And I mean, tell tell everybody here about uh, tell everyone here yeah, about the book. I, no, so I have about I have about seventeen years of journals that I kept. Okay, um, I started like in two thousand <laughs> when I was wrestling at Purdue University. I did it for a summer or so, and I put it away and I got it back out. Um, after I'd already started fighting, I was getting ready to move to California. Um, that's 2003, right? 2000, yeah, 2003. So uh, I initially was going to read through these old journals and, like, just uh, kind of write an autobiography. But, like, as I started reading the journals, I realized that there was no way I could really capture the, the obsessiveness kind of almost insanity, the craziness of what was going on at the time and through the process th through, through the autobiography kind of way. So instead, I was like, I'm just going to share the whole journal and then write, um, write kind of like my thoughts now, reflecting back on them, uh, you know, at the beginning and the end of the chapters. So, you know, I, I go through my move out to California, you kind of see me creating or helping a uh, team of AKA creating our, our, our training regiment. Um, Cause back then, like nobody really had a way of training MMA. We were, we were creating and developing systems that are, you know, used today by a lot of people. And uh, it was just interesting to see that, you know, I had, I had a bunch of fights without contracts, I had fights canceled opponents switching last minute there's all kinds of all kinds of crazy stuff staff infections um things Stuff. that you know i look back at now and i'm like that that's insane like i i was moving from indiana to california um i i knew i was moving i was like you know three weeks away from moving and i still hadn't found a place to live <laughs> uh, i found a place to live um on on craigslist and I had to pay, it was a guy I never met, I never talked to, we emailed, I sent him a check as a down payment, like he could have just taken the money, like it could have been a whole fake thing, I could have showed up and it was the house not there. <laughs> well, yeah, Lord knows there's like, a ton of that, those scams out there. 
it, it, yeah, I, you know, I had no, I didn't think about it, whatever. I just fit what I could in my car, what I couldn't fit. Um, I gave away to the younger wrestlers. Uh, it was me and my English bulldog, and we drew 2,200 miles up California. And, uh, you know, I, I, I rented a place site unseen. I had no idea. I talked to the guy the first time, like, as I got into California, because back then you had to pay for long distance. Wow. <laughs> right? I didn't want to pay long distance, so I didn't even call the guy. We emailed until I got to California. <laughs> That's unbelievable. Didn't, didn't want to get that long distance phone bill. Yeah, I didn't want to get hit for like six bucks. <laughs> I mean, you sure the guy was a real person. <laughs> but I moved, yeah, I moved all the way to California and back like that. I didn't have a bed. Uh, I didn't have enough money to buy one, so I slept on the floor for like two months. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That's a. It was, yeah, it was, it was, I mean, I just looking back, I was like, what did you, what are you doing? What did you do? You're a crazy person. Back then, I, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't a second thought to just like, ah, I'm going. That's I, it. No. I was going to say, you didn't even think twice about it back then. I mean, that was probably par for the I course. Knew, I knew I had to get to a different place because I had a lot of friends. Everybody was great. I loved all of them. But like, all there was to do was to drink. And, and smoke, and and that's it. Chase some pretty thick girls around. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't but, sound uh, like a bad time. <laughs> it's not, but like, for, like, your whole life, like, that was going to be it forever. Yeah. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah, and I was like, man, that, that's just not enough. Like, I, I want more. So I was in a good situation where I didn't have uh, student loans or anything to pay off. I had a little, little bit of cash to get me through a couple months. And I was like, you know, I, I get a job at a bar and, you know, I live cheap. I ate ramen noodles every day for years <laughs> and, you know, I just, I just made it work and it was, it was awesome. It was, it was a perfect thing to do. It was the great, greatest thing I did. I'm, I'm glad I made that risk. I took that risk and uh, definitely paid off. Even if I wouldn't have um, been successful in fighting or fighting wouldn't have, wouldn't have taken off because when I moved out, nobody knew what it was. I was going to say, back no, then it wasn't like, that popular, and I mean, obviously it blew up. Yeah, no, there were six UFCs a year. Pride was, was, was going pretty good underway. People were like that, but you had to watch it through the internet pretty much. And yeah, like people would ask me, and you'd have to spend 15 minutes explaining to them what you did or what you were doing. They didn't get it. <laughs> I just, back, I was like, oh, I just, I just work here and I'll hang out. <laughs> yeah, back, back then, it, like you said, people... Didn't, I mean, it was actually illegal for a little while, but I, no one really knew. Yeah, it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't sanctioned in, in all fifty states yet. Yep. One of the uh, first, I one of the first places that I know that uh, actually had it was Connecticut. I went to uh, Mohegan mm. Sun back back in the day. I can remember yeah. seeing Tank Abbott fight, and you know, it was it was fantastic. I love. I've always loved uh, martial arts, but. Back then, it was like, I used to stay in. I can remember I watched, uh, one of the first ones I ordered was Frank Mir versus uh, Tank Abbott. And mm. I, I can remember watching that fight, you know, people going, what the hell are you staying in watching this for? Me and two of my buddies stayed in drinking beers watching it. Everybody else went out for the night. Before Now, now every one of those guys watches every fight. when it, You know, if you order the fight, everyone's at the house watching it. They come to the studio here and we watch it. But back then, people, you couldn't get somebody to sit down and watch the fight with you. My, mm-hmm. my, how times have changed. No, I mean, I knew the sport was changing when I started seeing uh, groups of girls show up to UFC events alone. Mm-hmm. And they like were always usually, looking usually, hot. Yeah, it was usually a bunch of dudes and one chick or a guy who dragged his girl around and she wasn't really paying attention to him but actually wanted to be there. And then you started seeing groups of like three to six to eight girls just girls and they were there all by themselves looking completely dialed up there you know they're ready to be at the club and you know what that <laughs> what that does is it draws the guys in right afterwards so you're right you knew it was changing then and i mean it it did catch fire and it seems like it caught fire right at the right time for you i mean you were just coming into your uh you know into your career at this point when it started to take off um you uh you entered the ufc back at I mean, fighting you—you you fought on the second fight night, which I, th- I think is pretty insane. Yeah, that was... I guess I just saw a thing that my uh, 
My UFC debut was the UFC's 500th fight. Wow. Wow. That was, that's a while back. I mean, you're, I'm trying to think, what was that, 04 or 05? 05, I think. That was a while. I think it was 05, yeah. That's that a, was, uh, and that was uh, Brock Larson. That was a last minute, not last minute, but late, late, uh, whatever. Late fight. I, I took it on like six weeks' notice. I was a replacement. The Brock was 16 and 0. He was fighting at 185, and like they wanted to bring him in and build him up as like, because they had a very thin 185 pound weight class. They didn't have anybody. So they brought him in. He was supposed to beat somebody up. That guy got hurt, pulled out, and they're like, okay, let's feed him this guy. <laughs> yeah. We get, oh, we'll so get I went this in guy. there. Yeah, I went in there and I smashed him. And, uh, you know, that was a one-fight contract. So then they're like, okay. So yep. they brought me in another time to fight, I think, like Berkman. And that was a one-fight contract. Really? One and then I think I fight. fought Tiago. And that was a one-fight contract. So, like, the first three fights they gave me were to get me beat up. They wanted me to lose. Yeah. You were fought for somebody that they wanted to try to build up. Yeah. So then, because, uh, yeah, um, Berkman was a, a tough guy. He was on tough as yep. a fighter. Chago was, uh, you know, a, um, a stand-up guy with knockout parts. They wanted to build that guy up, and uh, yeah, I just I just spoiled their uh, they spoiled their plans every time. Did uh, when when was it that they actually started giving you multiple fight deals? I mean, was it after the Tiago Alves win? It was it was after the third yeah after the third win. Then I got a three fight deal. Gotcha, gotcha. Then actually, after after the Tiago Alves fight, you won another uh, what five fights in a row, I think, before you got to uh, GSP. Yeah, I won eight in a row. It was uh, sixteen in a row total because of the fights I won before. Yep. I uh, I got into the UFC, and then I lost to him, and I won another five, and then drew to BJ Penn. The how did you feel like? Because this is how I felt back then. Because I, I like I said, I've been watching a long time, and I'm a big fan. Uh, did you feel like they did not, absolutely not, want to give you that title fight? I felt like they did not want mm-hmm. you fighting GSP. No, because it's not a sport; it's a production, and they're basically a television show casting a role. So they already had the role of GSP cast. Yeah, they didn't need another wrestler out there, an athletic wrestler, um, white boy. They didn't need me. Yeah, ground and pound. <laughs> they already had me. Yep, they already had so a guy. I, they, yeah, they already needed me to. They needed me to be a different character <laughs> or go away. <laughs> yes. so they tried to get me to go away, and I wouldn't play sport. I wanted it to be a sport. I, I pushed hard against it. I wouldn't give them any of my personality. I gave them five interviews. I purposely kind of sabotaged myself because I didn't want their business model to be the business model. I didn't want it to be pro wrestling. I didn't want it to be to be some. Uh, I didn't want to see what it is right now. It, that's what it was pushing for. I think it's ugly, and I don't think it's entertaining. I don't like it. Yeah, I, I like sport. I like I like merit. I like you can have fun fun fights every once in a while, but I want the best guys and the best fighting style to be what rises to the top. I do think it's crazy that you can be the number one ranked contender and be overlooked four or five times for other contenders to fight before you actually get a title shot. And, you know, they just keep, like, I mean, there are multiple people that they've they, that's happened to, not just, you know, you. I don't understand how that, you know, works. And now, I mean, even with this upcoming weekend, they're saying that uh, if Conor McGregor wins a fight at 170, you know, they're saying that they're going to give him Khabib at 155. I don't know that that's a gift I'd really want, you know, handed to me. But, I mean, Conor gets uh, Conor gets gets a win this weekend. You know, they're saying he's getting another title fight. But it's that's because he's that character that they want to go ahead and push. I mean, Exactly. Yep. He's, he's, exactly. He's a character. They want to push that. They want to put it up there. They'll leverage fights to give them an advantage. Or at least they did up to this point. Uh, but yeah, that's all it is. They're just they're just selling a show. It's pro wrestling without the predetermined outcome, and I'm I'm not in for that. I don't I don't think that's entertaining. I'm not a I'm not a fan of that in any way. Yeah, um, if, I if like you, meritocracy. You can you can have the clown shows every once in a while. They're fun, but they should be undercard events, and they should not take precedence over a merit a merit based championship lineup. 
with an independent ranking and independent titles. I, I get scared saying this because I know I'm going to get you going, but the bottom line in my eyes is there has to basically be a champion. And if they wanted to follow, like, if they want to follow the uh, the mold set by professional wrestling, I mean, back in the day, there was a champion, and he used to travel to all the different territories and defend his title. So what I th- my opinion is, is that there should be a title, it should be out there, and if... You know, the Bellator, you know, say uh, in Bellator, John Fitch has won four in a row and he's ready to fight for the title. And, uh, ch- you know, the champion. Or, or then, how, about he, how about he drew with the ex-champion, <laughs> oh, which he dominated. I was and just going to say. Who beat him didn't dominate him as bad. Anybody who hasn't seen the Rory McDonald fight, I mean, I, I watched the fight from round one through the end. I personally, now, here's, here's my opinion on the fight. I don't know if our opinions are going to be the same or different, but I think that it was pretty close to you winning every round. I would say that if you were going to give a round to Rory, it'd be the it'd be the round that you shot, and when you shot, he lifted his knee at the same time and caught you, rocked you a little bit, but by the end of that round, you had recovered and been back on the offensive. I mean, I would say four rounds to one if I was going to be, you know, if I'm calling it right down the middle. I mean, I was a little biased, don't get me wrong. But if I'm calling that down the middle and I'm erring on the side of fairness, I would say four rounds to one. I mean, what would you have said? That, that, that was my, my thought. Uh, when I first, you know, through the fight, I thought it was three to two. And then I watched it once real quick afterwards. Again, I thought three to two. But then I watched it again close. Uh, a number of times, and even now when I watch it back, I think it was it, it's five to zero, oh, or at least four to to a draw. Four and one round was a draw. I think the fourth round was a draw, yeah. and that was when uh, I was in on the leg, and when he kicked out, he kneed me in the back of the head on accident, and that was what stumbled me. It wasn't anything that he did; it was an accidental thing. I had to put my head the wrong place, yeah. so I, I don't really see him winning or getting ahead. Uh, anywhere in that fight, I just it's, it's a frustrating thing, and not even to be considered now for the the the, the fight with Lima is just it's gross. Honestly, That's like who else is more accredited? Who else has done more? You know, I'm a, I haven't lost since 2014. I I own a belt. Like, why wouldn't I be the guy who fights Lima right now? I'm I'm actually confused as to that myself. See the, the now I'm looking here, and I mean I'm not gonna pretend like I know this offhand. I'm looking here on uh, the internet, but you fought you fought your first uh, fight against Paul Daly for the Bellator uh, umbrella, and it was uh, May twelfth. Then you don't get another fight until you fight Rory McDonald. And I can understand them holding off for the welterweight uh, Grand Prix that they did. I can understand them holding, but eleven months later you get a fight in April. Now, um, one thing that I'm, I am noticing a trend, though, these are they, they're keeping it in San Jose, California. They're not trying to get you to travel. But I was thinking to myself, are they planning on coming in March, having it 11 months later again? I mean, they're not really. I mean, you they haven't contacted you about fighting Douglas Lima. Uh, no, it's uh, it's not looking it's not looking good. I don't think I'm in consideration. I've had uh, my management, Crazy Bob, and them. Um, you know, letting them know that I'm I'm ready to go, and you know, me asking he doesn't he doesn't think it looks good. Wow, that's unbelievable. And you know, that's I mean, you so you you take you basically beat the will to fight out of Roy McDonald. As after the fight, he's saying he no doesn't think he any you know no longer wants to fight. He doesn't know if he has it in him anymore. After you know after I that do f- that to people. I have that effect on people. Well, if you, if you if you actually, I was gonna say if when you, you want to get your ass handed to you by an old man who's twelve years older than you, like you start to think that maybe oh maybe it's God that's telling me. No, it's the fact that I'm just that much better than you and most other people. Well, the thing I was starting to think to myself is maybe it's when actually somebody fights with you to a draw. <laughs> because you fought fought to a draw at BJ Penn. Since then, I mean, he's lost what eight in a row, and I mean. The guy's a the guy's a mess, and then on top of that, then you fight I Rory. Take people, I take people's fighting spirit. Yeah, it's like yeah, it'd be interesting if Rory like loses his next few fights also. Yeah, he's. I think he's about done. He just didn't. He just sign with another uh, organization. PFL. Yep. Yeah. I think that. Yeah, I think he's done mentally because I think he signed with a company where he could maybe win a million dollars, but I think he thinks the competition is lesser. 
Yeah, so he, he has an easier chance of winning the bigger money there. It, it, truthfully, I don't think that. I mean, no matter what federation you go into, there's gonna be monsters in every in every federation. It's it's basically. I mean, mixed martial arts is no longer, you know, the boxer versus the wrestler. It's basically everybody's pretty damn good at everything, especially at the top of the rankings. I mean, I'm sure you'd have to agree with that, right? Uh, I mean, yeah, like, uh, I mean, I, I like what Belter is doing. I like, uh, man, it's still hard to tell what ranks are, though, right now. Yeah. You're right, because you I've seen the Bellator rankings myself, my own two eyes. I was yeah. looking at it. Number one, John Fitch. Why why is this Well thing? that was that was like that was that was a fan's opinion, but but I think it makes the most sense. Like who else how would you rank anybody else above me? Like those guys haven't achieved anything where I've come close come close to. Um but uh I don't know, I feel like there's an industry push and just like kind of pushing me out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Quite honestly. Because because I speak up, I don't I don't play the game. I'm not gonna do the PR bullshit. Like I want to be a free agent. I want to be an independent contractor. Like I want to be able to say what I want to say. And if if I feel like the fighters are being exploited, I'm gonna talk about it. If I think that the title should be independent and that the ranking should be independent and it should be cross promotion, I'm gonna talk about it. I I, I know that I've sacrificed millions of dollars. I it's know unfortunate. because yeah. I for I. I refuse to keep my mouth shut, but I, I just refuse to sit around and take it in the boo boo. <laughs> <laughs> um, while while everybody around me and myself are being screwed over, I can see guys getting skipped in line for for big fights. I can see guys getting screwed on money all the time, being disrespected. Like what other sport have you ever seen a, a dominant person like the GSP get on their knees and beg somebody for a chance to fight for the title. Uh, yeah, it's a chance that they've already earned. Could you, could you imagine um, uh, um, who's, who's, I'm sorry, the, uh, the, the Patriots quarterback. Uh, Tom Brady. Uh, Tom Brady. Can you imagine Tom Brady getting on his knees and begging the president of the NFL to, or yeah. the owner, begging, begging, getting on his knees and begging the owner of the Patriots to let him play in the Super Bowl? <laughs> Please say it please. like that. Just sounds so, so ridiculous. <laughs> you, yes, what, he gets on his knee on the fifty yard line. Please, please give me the opportunity. Please let me play for the title. Yeah. I, how how ridiculous is that? That is. But you, that happens in that happens in MMA. Know, That's gross. <laughs> it's That's really gross. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Do you think that? Do you think that maybe you know, like uh, Bellator or UFC? I mean, do you think that it has anything to do with age, where they might want like the a, a younger lion up and coming with like you know ten or fifteen more fights left? I it, mean, it it has to do with how much money they can make off the guy. Yeah, how much money does it cost them to have him fight, and how much money can they make off of him? There's a few factors in that because a guy could could get a lot of eyeballs and generate a lot of income. But if he asks for too much, they they don't want him around. Yeah. If they can get somebody who brings in close to that many eyeballs, but asks for less money, and, and this like they've done this a few times where they have people who want to fight for the title. They'll get three guys who want to fight for the title, and they'll get a reverse bidding war <laughs> with these guys. I so they have to like say, "I'll fight for less. I'll fight for less in order to get the opportunity to fight for the belt." That's oh, that's gross. Like you said, that's it's that's gross. almost as gross it's as gross. people begging for title shots. That's that's real. Oh, yeah, that's painful. I oh, like man. you're you're contracted for you know whatever hundred thousand dollars to fight uh, for your next fight, and they're like, well, hey, I'll I'll fight for free for the title. I just give me the title shot. Yeah, like they're gonna take the guy they can exploit the most and and, and make the most money off of. Um, Some tells yeah, me you're not making that off of. They want to keep guys, uh, you know, away from pay per view bonuses too. Yeah. That's so they can keep a new guy from getting a return, uh, uh, you know, defending his belt and getting pay per view money. Like they'll do what they can to keep that guy away from pay per view money before he gets the idea and then wants it every time, right? Ugh. Mm. I <laughs> well, that, the the way they usually do it is if you win a title and then you defend it, then you're you're option into getting pay-per-view money but not until then yeah 
and then the bigger names. Unless like, you're like a, unless you're like a Brock, Brock yeah. Lesnar type. His his pay per view numbers, I guess, were through the roof. So I, I almost think that once, because he was yeah. another one that fought on real small contracts, he did that on purpose so he yeah. could after his first one, so he could walk mm-hmm. away and he used. He was, he was it's, smart. And, uh, it's it's pretty, and the reason the pay per view is so high with him is because like they have nurtured a pro wrestling fan base. Like it's almost identical. The the MMA fans uh, compared to. Uh, pro wrestling fans, it's like they're the same. They're the same. There's a huge discrepancy. They're like zero boxing fans. If when you when you look at the boxing fans, hardly any boxing fans watch MMA. And, yeah. And and um, only a, a small amount of MMA fans watch the big boxing fights. You're right. They don't watch any of the uh, smaller fights or the you know like there's, the... there's hardly there's hardly any crossover. But if you look at MMA and pro wrestling, it's like a hundred percent crossover. Yep. They're like the same people. They cultivated that fan base on purpose. It's it's pretty gross too when you look at it and you think. I mean, if you think about this, right? It, I mean, uh, someone even like yourself. I mean, you got thirty two wins in your career, and the salaries that you command are you know substantially less than somebody like CM Punk. Who walks in? You know, I mean, he's an zero and two. You know, an zero and two professional record, and has never been competitive in a fight one time. Yet he can demand. You know, he. I think they said someone told me he gets a. He got a flat rate of five hundred thousand dollars a fight. Yeah, and he fought. Uh, yeah, I'm, well, I mean, that shows you what meritocracy uh, and um, notoriety get you. Because even though he's not a good fighter, he has a false meritocracy and uh, notoriety, actual notoriety from pro wrestling. So he has a bargaining chip. He's like, I don't need to fight. Like, you make a lot of money off of me fighting. So, like, you know, I, I, I make this much money just doing fake wrestling, but, you know, fake stuff. Yep. Like, you're going to have to pay me a lot to get me in there to do it. I'm interested, but you're going to have to make it worth my while. <laughs> so, like... Then, then he has because because he has options because he's got forced competition that doesn't exist in MMA because UFC has a monopoly. Like he is able to go outside, and that's why one reason you see so many fighters talking about going to WWE. It's one of the reasons why Kane went to uh, pro wrestling. Kane Velasquez himself, like he wanted to go back and fight, but they were they were screwing him on the contract. They weren't going to give him the money he wanted, so. He went to pro wrestling. Went to Lucha Libre. He did a great job doing that wrestling. Did the flying stuff with this huge dude, and like WWE picked him up. Yeah, of course. I mean, make, WWE make more money. money. Signs. He probably made more money in that in the WWE appearance than he's made in several fights put together. Yeah, and I mean, how long? If you think about it, I mean, he he made one long plane ride to Saudi Arabia. He was yeah. outperforming for what would you say? Six minutes, seven minutes, yeah. And, and with all the injuries he sustained, you know, back, neck, everything in the UFC, he probably trumped multiple. Pay- I mean, he legitimately, if you think about it, I mean, don't get me wrong, professional wrestling is definitely, definitely taxing and things like that. But his wrestling match with Brock Lesnar, I mean, he didn't even take a big bump; he took an uh, uh, an arm lock finish. And mm-hmm. if you think about that, as opposed to some of the other fights he's fought in the octagon and taken multiple injuries, here you go. He's probably, like you said, he probably took out six or seven paydays in that one trip to Saudi Arabia. I mean, yeah, it's just there. Yeah. So that's that's the that's the ploy that guys are using uh, as leverage to get more money from the UFC. The other one is threatening to become a pro boxer. In my boxing license, I'm protected by the Ali Act. I might be able to generate more money through boxing than you're willing to pay me yep. because it's a free market, independent titles. They already have the notoriety. They can generate more money. The Ali Act is actually what you guys actually are basically fighting for in the uh, lawsuit yep. against the, in the the big lawsuit. We, we uh, introduced it twice. Uh, second time we... Got 58 co-sponsors and eventually went to a uh, uh, House subcommittee hearing. We did a great job in the subcommittee hearing, but then when it came to a vote, they ended up, uh, the whip or the head of the committee ended up burying it, so it never came to the vote. 
Uh -huh. so it was, and that was, you know, somebody who Trump got to because Dana White's been butting up to Trump. Well, <laughs> I mean, that sounds like that sounds like a Dana uh, move. I, that's, I mean, that seems like that's part of the and course. That, and that's, and I mean, uh, and that's why they did it. So WME is a big uh, Hollywood representative firm, right? They they're big players in Hollywood. So so all those Hollywood type people are far left leaning people, right? Then why would they have so much energy put into cozying up to Trump? <laughs> Easily, because they don't. What they don't want is they don't want number one so this coming all, out to the public. And well, all the all the and, and it proves that all the virtue signaling type stuff that they do is all BS. Mm -hmm. They don't care. They don't care. They just want to make their money. They don't care. They don't care about equal rights. They don't care about Me Too. They don't care about any of that crap at all it's all fake they're virtue signaling trying to pretend that they're morally superior to people and they go around and do dirty stuff behind people's backs and exploit people and it's they take away from the sport i mean because it is a great sport and they take away from that because there's no like you said there's no merit to wins there's no you know the going down the line it's like i mean even khabib so, this is the this is the number one fighter in the world right now like the how boy, many fights did that dude have to win to get a title shot. I mean, it's that's ridiculous. It is hundred percent ridiculous. And he still never lost. And it's like, I mean, they say that he's lost you one know, round. <laughs> and the uh, uh, Tony Ferguson himself also has gotten screwed royally by the UFC. Absolutely. And you know what? He's been lined. He he had been lined up to fight people multiple times that got injured. I mean, Khabib was injured twice when uh, they were scheduled to fight, and. Then he just keeps getting passed over, passed over. I mean, how many fights has he yeah. won? It's, he hasn't lost in a really long time. Yeah, and the same. I mean, Khabib never had lost, and it took him years to get a title shot. And even on the yeah. even on the garbage rankings, he, you would yeah, see he, the, he, he, bro he broke my record. I had to win eight fights to get a title shot. He broke my record. <laughs> well, it's not really. I'm sure it's not necessarily a record Khabib wanted to break, <laughs> right? <laughs> Wow. Yeah, let's say yeah. I had a talk with him a while ago. He, you know, I was like, "Hey, man, don't, don't fucking worry about the title shot. Just keep having fun, keep winning fights, just doing what you're doing. Don't even think about it." Because you know, I got swept up in the whole title bullshit, and uh, it, it's just no good. You just gotta, you just gotta have fun. Keep having fun. They can't stop you if you're having fun. Yeah, and and that guy has. I mean, he's played his cards perfectly. I mean, he. Basically fell into the Conor McGregor fight, you know. I mean, eventually you knew that was going to happen, and he basically he stayed pretty cool, calm, and collected, and didn't buy buy into the, uh, you know, all the hype. And then <laughs> he bought into it once the cage door closed. Unfortunately for Conor, but I mean, hmm. <laughs> this guy he's, it's he's just business made. It's just business. That sounds a lot <laughs> different than it did before the fight. That's for sure. Yeah. A lot of people yeah, don't know, but he's actually it. he's actually done Double some training with you guys. Can... Yeah, elbows in the uh, in the face can change the tune. Yeah. yeah, Khabib came back. He came to start training with us way back, 2013 or so, maybe sooner. But uh, yeah, nobody knew who he was. He wasn't known. Him and all these guys, like he he was such a fan. Honestly, we we're like, okay, yeah, whatever. When he first came in, but, like him and his guys, they were big fans of AKA. Like Dagestan loves AKA. <laughs> they were huge there, I guess. So like we were like, yeah, okay, whatever. We had guys coming all the time. Whatever. But these guys were, man, they could wrestle. They were tough. They came to train their ass off every single day. It was nuts. So, like, having them come into the gym was such a rejuvenation for us. It, it was really awesome. We really, we were really, uh, man, it's like evidence, man, just put good energy out there. Put good energy out there. Work hard. And, and good things will find you. If you're doing the work, good things will find you. I think, I think. Uh, the Dagestani gangsters coming to us is proof of that. And, and you know what's funny is I've actually heard on a number of occasions that these are actually really fun people to be around. They're not, you know, people think that they're they're, you know, they're amazing. They're they're ama seriously amazing human beings. They they really are. That's... He does so much good stuff. He doesn't drink. They don't, you know, they're they're devout Muslims. They don't they don't screw around with any of that crap. They're not chasing girls. They're not like fake about who they are, what they're trying to represent. Like, it's just them. They're good people. Like, I really like being around them. And they bring good, fun energy. You know, like, 
they beat they train their ass off. Like they'll 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 beat you up in practice. They'll kick your ass if you're, you're trying to be lazy and take it easy. But afterwards, they'll put the music on and they'll do the Russian dance thing. <laughs> it's a fucking it's a party, dude. It's it's so much fun with these guys. It really is. Yeah, yeah. I hope I can get out to Dagestan and, and, and do some seminars or whatever. I'd love to meet some people. They, I'll tell you what, they seem like they seem like they're having a really good time. I mean, that normally comes with being the champ and undefeated, I'm sure. But you know, I mean, they seem like they're just having a good time. Besides all that crap with Conor McGregor and the doll <laughs> and all that, but well, besides, they seem they like work hard, play hard. But at the same time, yeah, they they have an honor culture, and if you disrespect somebody who lives in an, an honor type culture, like you're asking for some major trouble, bro. Yeah, they. <laughs> that's not that you know. That's not exactly a, a group of people too to start any trouble with. They, they, they seem like they stick to themselves. And when you come, I in, mean, you go go to the hood. Think about the the most dangerous hood you can think of that you know of. Right, go there and 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 disrespect somebody's mother. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> see what see what happens. Yeah, see uh, what happens. Let us know how that works like, out. They don't. Yeah, let 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 me know how it works out. Let me know if they're just like. You know, verbally upset with you, or or they pull out a gun and shoot you in the face. Like, <laughs> there's just certain things with certain people. They just don't give an f. Like, it, you know, people who live in those type of cultures, honor culture, in a small environment, well, like, you do something that disrespects them. You don't think it's a big deal because you live in this huge world where, like, whatever, if somebody insults you, it's not a big deal. But like for them, like they have to go back to their village. They have to go back to that small community. And if they got pinched out, somebody, like the whole community knows what happened. Yeah, the whole community knows, you know, and will bring up what happened constantly. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to be on the receiving end of the uh, anger that comes with that. That's for sure. I'll pass on that. So I, one thing I did want to do, John, I did want to go ahead and get some uh, picks from you. I want to take a brief moment to go ahead and uh, uh, hit on one of our sponsors, but then we're going to come back with John Fitch. We're going to get a quick breakdown here. He's already given us a ton of time. We appreciate it, guys. One moment for a word from our sponsor. Hey, guys, if you know me and you know I'm into fitness, I'm also into really great food. Sadly, sometimes I cannot control my weakness for pizza. We all know that. Great news is our friends at Real Good Foods... I lend it a helping hand. I can't get enough of that gluten-free, grain-free chicken pizza. Amazing. Only 4 grams of carbs with a whopping 25 grams of protein. Yes, guys, the crust is made of all-natural white meat chicken. Use promo code KINGHAP to save 15%. www.realgoodfoods.com. Guys, go get it. All right, we're back. Thank you for that, John. I appreciate you uh, holding on and uh, coming back with us here. I did want to get your uh, ideas here on the upcoming fights because this is a card that's been really uh, waited for with the Cerrone-McGregor fight. I'm sure that, you know, you're interested in that one. The rest of the card doesn't seem like it's the, you know, greatest put-together card. I'm sure you've seen that, too. I was, I was just going to say, like, all this smack that the UFC and Dana talked about boxing... <laughs> What what is this card? This is a boxing card. Exactly cut. the same thing that they were hating on. Like they built their brand on five amazing, at least five amazing main card fights. Now now where are we? And you know they cut the yeah. biggest roster they've ever had too. It's unbelievable yeah. that they don't put on. Yeah, I mean even just a, a you know it, one of the main things that I noticed too is that any card. That's not, you know, that's kind of lacking. You can throw on just a heavyweight slugfest, and that will dress up the card a little bit. And I'm, I yeah. mean, just an example like guaranteed over, knockout. Exactly. This card, however, does not have any of that. The one thing that they're doing is they're using the uh, Conor McGregor aura to sell this this card, and it probably will do pretty well. I mean, you probably think so too. Oh right? yeah, yeah, it'll break records, probably. All right, one of the uh, all that stuff going on. So yeah, the, I don't really have any picks with the other, other card, you know, the rest of the card, because I, I mean, I don't know, and nobody really moves me that much in those fights. I hear you. Um, One of the fights with the with the uh, Connor and Cerrone fight, you know, Cerrone has everything he needs to to beat that, to beat him and win. You know, he's got length and long, great leg kicks, so he could he could use his striking to corral uh, Connor's movement and just chop the hell out of that front lead leg. 
he would never have to come in the boxing range and could beat up that front leg uh, for the first two rounds. After he's beat up that leg for two rounds, Connor could slow, would slow down and he'd be able to get inside a boxing range and do more damage because Connor can't move left or right or in and out as, as, as good as he would if he had a good two good legs. Now he's got one good leg. Yep, I feel like so, he's he's a lot faster. I feel like his his movements are going to be faster than Cerrone, but you're right. That leg kick would definitely yes, be something that would exactly. soften that up. So, so, so he does that. Or or once he's beat that leg up for two rounds, then he can look for uh, um, uh, takedowns yep. and then use his jitsu to submit them. That, that, those are great game plans. Either one of those would be great, but he's not going to do that. Was, he's already been baited into a stand and bang mentality. And if he goes in there standing and bang with Connor, there's a good chance he gets the left hand and loses. They um, said, I don't know if you heard his call, his quote, uh, actually said that, um, you know, yeah, I probably should go in and uh, try to take him down and use some jujitsu on him. But, you know, it's my stupidity and, you know, it's my fight and my stupidity. I'll go ahead and, you know, mm-hmm. do it my way. Already sounds yeah. like he's kind of mailed it in. I don't know. Maybe, who knows? Maybe he's getting some kind of bonus like the old. Uh, well, he, he already said he said he got a six fight deal. That are all money fights, so he he's gotten a deal where he thinks he's set for life because of the next six fights. What did they negotiate in yeah. order to uh, get him those six fight numbers? You know, was it, uh, hey man, you've been doing real great job, but you're standing bang. Keep that up. People do this, and like, and that's not guaranteed money either with that contract. He still has to fight. They could put him on the shelf. They could not fight him again. They could cut him if he loses. That's true. And, you know, they. <laughs> the funny thing is, is they used to say that um, Elite XC back in the day used to tell people, we're going to give you this fight with, um, you know, the main event against Kimbo. Yep. You're going to have to stand and the whole Dana, time. Dana quoted as being like, that's illegal, whatever. Like, I guarantee they do this. They don't do it as explicitly as that, but they, they still do it. Yep. You know? They talk about, oh, be exciting. If you go out there and have an exciting fight, to them, exciting is standing and big. You know that. They keep it standing. Yeah. That's exciting. That's what they mean. They don't, they're not going to give it out to the wrestling match of the night or, you know, the ground. And, but, you know, yeah. they want they want somebody getting their head bashed in. You know, they want blood, things like that. that you know, like you said, the pro wrestling model. Yep. That brings the money. But I'll tell you what, one thing that I did, I, w- I am with this fight, I'm thinking to myself, is if Cerrone goes in there to stand and bang, I do think he gets the left hand, and I think he goes to bed early. If mm-hmm. he doesn't, though. He, and he, he doesn't, I don't think he does well under pressure either. He always loses the top 10 guys. That's either a skill set thing or it's, it's yeah, a, mental, a mental thing, a mental bridging yeah. and gap. Do you remember the fight against Rafael Dos Anjos? I'm not sure if you remember. I did not see it. Yeah, for the title. He went in there. We had, I'll tell you what, my, my Big D, he's uh, he was a huge Cerrone fan. We, we Everybody was together. You know, all the guys were here. We were all drinking, sitting down. The main event came along. It was for the title. And he went out, and the fight was over in, I mean, I think it was like 15, 20 seconds. He got caught, and then ground and pound, and it was over. And everybody was sitting there just looking at themselves like, oh, my God. And it's... I feel like he's a real slow starter, which is the exact opposite of Conor McGregor. I mean, McGregor's known to go out there and put the lights out quick. And if he doesn't, he gets, usually ends up in trouble. I'm thinking, you know, like you said. If well, he, Conor, is a, Conor, is, Conor is a counter striker, though. Yep. So, uh, Cerrone's slow start may may help him out a little bit. Oh. Because if he's slow to start, he's less likely to rush in. Like Jose Aldo, he rushed in. He was so mad he wanted to fight. He rushed in, caught a last and it was over. That that fight right there, his trash talk set his career up in that fight because he was he had yeah. Aldo so mad that he he had his hands down yeah. and come running at He ran into it. He thought he was indestructible. I'm so mad I'm gonna hurt this guy. Walked right into it. You That's see the track. you see the people at the bars hitting the punching machine, and they get the running start to hit it. It was basically like the punching machine got the running start from McGregor on that one. It was yeah, it, was, yep. it adds to the adds to the force if you're moving in. Yep. If if I told you, John, right, that con- now your your own money here, your per your your next your fight purse when you uh, win the title against Lima is on the line. And I tell you, McGregor's a minus three fifty favorite. Cerrone plus two seventy five. At that point, who who are you going with? 
Uh, I gotta be honest, I don't even understand the gambling. <laughs> so if if you Numbers. bet to make a hundred to make a hundred dollars on Conor McGregor, you gotta bet three fifty. If you bet a hundred on Donald Cerrone, you get back two seventy five. Ah, I gotcha. Well, That's, I mean, you, you always you always play the underdogs to make more money. Yep, yep. I mean, it's if look at those gamble, odds. You might as well gamble, right? Yep. Because you if you're gambling, it means you got the money to lose anyway. True that. And <laughs> minus, if you're doing it right, <laughs> yeah, minus three fifty. Don't, don't be looking to pay the rent. Yeah, exactly. Uh, comedian Adi Lang, I'm sure you know who he is, but he always had a joke where he's like, if you think a game's, you know, if you think a game's boring, go ahead, look at your bank account, add ten thousand to it, put it on that game, and see how much, see how boring that game is. But uh, <laughs> guy cracks me up. But in this fight here, these odds, I feel like a dead on. I feel like Cerrone's the better bet if you're gonna bet. If I was gonna pick, I if I had to pick, I would probably say McGregor. I mean, that's not, I mean, in the end, who you think gets their hand raised? Oh, man, I hate to say it, but I think Conor is more than likely probably going to get the win. Yep, and I think that's what the UFC wants because they want another cash cow fight or two. But, I mean, then again, I mean, all of the stress that he's under because of, you know, the sexual assault and rape allegations, all this other stuff, maybe he's, like, mentally broken. Who knows? He might be, he might be financially broken. That's why he's talking all crazy about his finances. I, I to, to think that he they he made a reported hundred million dollars fighting uh, Floyd Mayweather, and to think that he may be out of money. And no, it was like eighty five. Well, eighty five uh, for the fight, and another fifteen for uh, sponsors, I believe. Yeah. So, uh, but it, re, even to say that he made over fifty million, and to think that I mean that wasn't that long ago. To think that he's actually low on money is ridiculous. Well, the. Uh... Well, the numbers with the UFC, he was he was making up. Those aren't those aren't real numbers. There's no yeah. way. Like the the money, the, the the what you see through our uh, uh, class action lawsuit, with the numbers and stuff that's come up, there's absolutely zero chance that he made fifty million. Uh, you know, against Khabib, there's no way he made a lot of the money that he said and claimed he made. Yeah. It. it... I mean, don't get me wrong. If you ask some, you know, even Joe Schmo on the street, hey, how much you make? You know, it's, uh, you know, it's, it, they're not going to, oh, yeah, I make, you know, and they're going to, oh, yeah, I make 50000 a year. No, they're going to say, oh, yeah, I make uh, 80000 a year. But well, to... I, I think part of it, too, is because, like, he said a lot of crazy stuff in interviews with Ariel and some other people. I think he's trying to make talking points. Uh, for people to talk about, because he wants them to talk about those things rather than the sexual assault stuff. Yeah. Yep. And that's exactly right. He's, he's basically creating a smoke smoke screen. If yeah. all these people talk about the money, if they talk about him boxing again, him bo- boxing Floyd again, all of this stuff. If people start talking about that and are distracted by that, then they're less likely to put attention on you know, the real issues that he's dealing with. True. And people, he'd, he'd rather have the attention there. It's funny now that he does talk to all the media that he used to stay away from, you know, the MMA, you know, Awa, things like that, with, you know, Ariel and all them. He, you know, mm-hmm. these were the people he was ignoring and not, now all of a sudden he's on the show talking, you know, singing a different tune. And, and if you notice, like, all of the interviews, everything that he's been doing, it's all canned. Like, they don't just let a random reporters ask him questions. And when they do, he gets asked hard questions about the uh, assault allegations yep. and all the crimes he's committed, the 19 convictions he's had in Ireland. Like, what country do you know that you can get into if you've been convicted of 19 crimes? <laughs> That's that, that <laughs> not is charged, crazy. not accused of, but actually convicted. He's been convicted of 19 crimes. <laughs> you know, and people are probably scared that if they ask him the questions, that what's going to happen is they're going to get blackballed by you know, and then people. Hundred like, percent. Somebody did some, and somebody did. Somebody asked a question, and and they got their press passes removed. See, and that's what's going to happen. And then all the other fighters, yeah, don't go to this guy. You know, stay away from him. They're going to get the orders from their boss. So it's a it's a tough situation. So you can't really be too up front with these interviews with, you know, somebody like Connor. So they're going to just keep asking him the fluff questions like you hear, you know. Well, it's all, it's all been changed. It's all, it's all you know, preempted. Everything's been approved. All the questions have been approved. Like, 
like none of the none of the questions or interviews or asking questions are asking anything that isn't already on the list of questions that are approved that they can ask. It's uh, that's unbelievable, <sighs> John. I, I want to take a minute and uh, for everybody here at the happy hour, as well as, you know, uh, the happy hour social club members and everybody, I want to take a minute and actually just, you know, thank you for coming on the show. It's been fantastic having you. Um, any Is there anything else you'd like to say before we let you go? Anything you want to tell the uh, happy hour social club listeners? No, man. I just uh, want you all to, uh, you know, check out the, the website, jumpers.net, turn up the and, uh, you know, it's been great talking to everybody. Check out the, you know, the podcast and stuff. We're working hard to put out some good content, and thanks for everybody. Absolutely. Everybody, make sure you give him a follow on Instagram, too. Like I said, he's a fun follow. Great, great content coming out of there. I, um, you know, I, I again, for everybody, I can't thank you enough. What I want to do is I'm going to leave everybody with the world premiere of the uh, Happy Hour version 2 from Abyss. Everybody, I hope that you have a great night for, for myself, for Big D, and for uh, John Fitz, the number one ranked welterweight in the world. Good night, everybody, and thank you so much for listening. Yeah, thanks, man. Thanks, thank, guys. Thank you. Abyss. Happy Hour. Happy Hour. AbyssHipHop.com. Hey. Sports fanatics applauding at the matches. Picking winners when we sift through the brackets. Yeah. Turf green like a bag of sour. We gotta talk in that podcast is the happy hour. Meta come to the game fully geared. Who would dare? Been beast most the rookie years. Yeah. Little fact for the lightning round. This is Title Town, the place where all of the fires found. We attend games on a regular. Heard more goals than a motivation seminar. Yeah. Stay charged like a visa. So many bad calls. No, we stop it by the most bleachers. So click play and just soak it up. This is happy hour, but not the same as your local pub. Sports talk, hear the pro shows a must. So scroll like the page, call the happy hour social club. Boss moves, so you know your boy paid them tools. Front row, you can see us through your pay per view. Fights on, watching them box like big parcels. The MMA, know that the art is mixed martial. Listen, guests, you better play your best. You're playing fast, and better go take a breath and just play the bench. Yeah. Clap hard with these two hands. Been true fans, reading stats off the newsstand.